Only the supreme dude abides. But that one supreme dude <laughs> abides as the essence of every little dude who thinks he's somebody but who is only an illusion. What is important is to recognize that within the illusion, within the suffering and the pain and the torment of that little dude who pretends he's big, shines a diamond of otherworldly luminescence within the lotus of his essential nature that he himself may not yet know. The ego structure at the end of Kali Yuga has morphed very rapidly. Even in the days of Carl Jung, the structure of the ego failed to reach maturity. But he called that ego that remained childish and childlike throughout chronological adulthood, the puer eternus. And he used the archetype of a famous story called The Little Prince to exemplify the nature of this Peter Pan-like figure who attempted to flit through life without ever having to be burdened by responsibility. But the little prince has indeed morphed and warped into the big Lebowski, <laughs> who is a child of the hell realm, not of some heavenly planet of his imagination, but whose mind has been warped by too much acid and too much pot and too many experiences of nihilistic encounters with his own and others' death drives and has become enmeshed in a kind of maya which has been burdened by so many defense mechanisms that the capacity to even imagine freedom or anything different from the current situation in which he finds himself again and again being captured in a nightmare of life in which he is exiled, that he cannot see that within this hell realm there is a consciousness that supersedes all of his own judgments about reality. And that it is this supersession of judgment that is the portal to freedom. Because non-duality must integrate every aspect of both the real and appearance. The unlimited must integrate and include the limited or if it simply attempts to 
separate itself from the limited, it finds the unlimited itself becomes limited and exiled from its ability to transform its own phenomenal appearance. And thus the situation of the yogi who wishes to deny and to separate from and dissociate from his or her egoic appearance finds that that leaves a situation in which the tail wags the dog. But why let the ego tail affect the dog of the real self? Why allow the dog not to recognize that its godliness includes its dogliness and that its tail can bring great happiness when wagged in the right way. What this means is that one must not allow appearances and narratives and judgments and conventionalities of rules and regulations to get in the way of one's bliss. Because the bliss does not depend on whether one has a healthy ego or a dysfunctional, ridiculous, postmodern, stunted ego. Since the ego is unreal anyway, it is no obstacle. And you don't need to laboriously grow it up before attaining liberation. Let it be whatever it is. Let it pee on the rug. (laughs) But be free of your judgment of your own ego and that of others. And you will then find that the ego will treat the rug with great care because it will find that its own existence now has value to its own being and is no longer reduced to being an object of disgust, an abject, a figure of toxicity in its own mind and heart. And through this contentment with its own egoic appearance, with all the comedy of errors that that implies, with all the ludicrousness at the end of Kali Yuga that is inherent to every egoic appearance, and often even more ridiculously to those egos who do take themselves seriously and consider that they have grown to the highest levels of sophistication and goodness and capacity for mature abidance in and with the law. But there comes a time when even the law becomes an obstacle, when even the judgments of dharma become an affair of duality that must be transcended. And it is in this level of one's realization of the non-dual self that the razor's edge of life reaches its sharpest and narrowest point because it is extremely important never to allow the ego tail to appropriate the truth of the dog's reality and never to inflate itself or to justify itself on the basis of non-duality. But the self that transcends all need to affirm itself 
through conventional judgments in which it would appear in certain ways to others to gain approval must also be transcended so that one does not become enslaved to the phenomenality of one's appearance, whether good or bad. And one is able to follow the path of truth with the scent of the booty mind completely opened to the most subtle nuances of those traces of divinity that appear as love and that appear as the discovery of those lost, secret, hidden chambers of the heart that must all be opened before liberation can be achieved. And in those doors that include chambers that include forbidden knowledge and unbearable knowledge, and knowledge of a kind that would produce shame and guilt when opened, and that would produce the torment of failure, must themselves be drunk to the dregs and not denied, and transformed into the nectar of immortality that is specifically made of those poisons. And it is only when we have the capacity to transform them in our throats and then transmit them as the blue light of that world-weary transcendental wisdom that accepts all with compassion. Only in that blue-throated condition of the one who has drunk the poison and accepted that the phase of reality known as Kali Yuga must be included as part of the soul's legitimate journey through its own dark night if it is ever to find its way to the real eternal light of God's presence and to be able to abide there without returning for another round of Kali Yugic illusion. It is in this transcendence of the duality that is imposed by dharma as a superstructure of existence for the immature ego, that for the mature soul for whom God is no longer wholly other, nor even just the holy other that one aspires to, but is realized as the self of oneself that all one's concern for the otherness of egoic judgments can fall away. And true freedom within this phenomenal plane, not simply in the beyondness of some nirvanic future, can be lived here and now in the beauty and the majesty of the liberated madness of that being who recognizes there is one dreamer of this dream and thou and thou alone art that